Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the 48th Vice President of the United States of America, Mike Pence. How you doing? Thank you for doing this. Sorry, my mic is on. Woo! Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for coming. You bet. Thank you, Tucker. So great. How about a round of applause for Tucker Carlson for being here and doing this, everybody? The only I thought I was going to get off easy. I got on stage. There was no Tucker. So. You know there's a recession when one of us doesn't have a job. Uh, it's <laughs> me. Uh, that would actually be two of us, Tucker. Is it, actually, I'll start there. Is, are we in a recession? You know, I think there's a real possibility that it's already hit parts of the country. Yeah. I mean, look, Joe Biden comes into office, and along with Democrat majorities in the House and Senate, they, they launched a gusher of spending, $2 trillion in unnecessary spending that that initiated the worst inflation in 40 years. They launched a war on energy. They dismantled all of our successful policies at the border, created the worst border crisis in history. And the reason I'm running for president of the United States is because I know we can do better. We can bring this nation back. We can restore the American economy. We can secure our border. And we can stand for the God-given liberties that have always made this country strong and true and great. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. I, and we can certainly do better, that's for sure. Um, so I have to ask you, since you were a witness to, and in some yeah. unintentional way, a participant in one of the most widely covered events in American history, January 6th, what was that? Do you think that was an insurrection? Well, first, look, can I just take a moment just to say thank you to the family leader, to Bob Vanderplatz and the whole team here, and to our friends at Blaze TV, including my old friend Glenn Beck. I, we're standing here on a historic day in Iowa, when in just a few short hours, Governor Kim Reynolds would take to this stage and sign into law historic protections for the unborn. And I think all the members of the family leader here in Iowa prayed and worked and fought to bring us to this day. And it's an honor to be with you all. It really is. Now, as to that day, let me just say, uh, all I know for sure, having lived through it, at the Capitol, is that it was a tragic day. Um, I've never used the word insurrection, Tucker, over the last two years, but it was a riot that took place at the Capitol that day. I saw firsthand in the, where they'd evacuated us down to the loading dock below the Senate chamber, police officers that, as the day wore on, were streaming through 150 law enforcement officers that were assaulted. Obviously, the tragic loss of life ransacking the capital that occurred. But I really do believe that a day of tragedy became a triumph of freedom. And I'll always believe that by God's grace, I did my duty that day under the Constitution of the United States of America and our institutions held. When, when you say the tragic loss of life, who are you referring to? Well, obviously, uh, Ashley Babbitt would come to mind immediately. Do, what do you when think I of the think fact of the, that she was shot? Well, I, I just think it was a tragic moment, without question. But I, would, I have to tell you that seeing people assaulting law enforcement officers, smashing windows, breaking into the Capitol building, it infuriated me. And it's very likely that... Um, the restraint that was shown by law enforcement officers saved lives that day. But I think it's, it's, it's important that we hold those accountable who perpetrated acts of violence and vandalism in our nation's capital. But I also, I'm still waiting for equal vigor and equal prosecutions to be brought on those that brought hundreds of BLM riots to cities across America. Amen. I mean, the truth is, you know, we, we, we don't make progress in this country by walking away from the rule of law. We, we uphold the rule of law, and we apply it equally and fairly. 
And I think that holding those accountable that rioted at the Capitol that day is right and proper. But I also believe that people that engaged in the hundreds of riots over the summer of 2020 literally burned out you know, family businesses and communities and, and also cost lives yes. must be held to account. Amen. So we, we spent, when the BLM riots happened and the, the riot in front of the White House that injured more law enforcement personnel than January 6th, um, we spent a lot of time talking about why those rioters were mad. They were mad about systemic racism and the death of George Floyd, et cetera. Why do you think the people who swarmed the Capitol on January 6th were mad? And why haven't we talked about that? Well, first off, I, I, I would tell you that um, I think the January 6th committee was a partisan committee in the Congress of the United States. And it, it, and it failed its historic mission of bringing the facts forward. Yep. And I know your commitment to bringing all the facts to the American people, Tucker. And I know we're grateful for that. And the truth of the matter is, as some members of the staff of the January 6th committee said after it adjourned, they spent all their time focused so much on one individual and on placing blame that they spent very little time focusing on law enforcement failures that happened that day and intelligence failures that happened that day. And I hold to the view that we can never let this happen again. We can never allow the capital of the greatest nation on earth to be subject to a riot for any purpose, for any motivation. And for that reason, we need to understand why law enforcement that day was not better equipped, yeah. better prepared, where the intelligence failures were. Uh, and I believe that in time we'll have those answers. Amen. Uh, but I wonder, though, again, about motives, since these were, and I'm not excusing any act of violence ever anywhere, including on January 6th. However, they were American citizens. Most of them didn't commit acts of violence, and they were really mad. And they were mad because they thought the election was unfair. Right. And I wonder why more time hasn't been spent by either party reassuring Americans that our elections are, are real, that, that all votes are counted, that the electronic voting machines, which no one seemed to trust 10 years ago now are infallible, why mail-in voting is a good thing. Like, why doesn't anybody try to reassure the public that the mechanics of voting are legit? And, and are they? Do you think the last election was fair? Well, as I said on January 6th in my communication to the Congress, and I've said many times since, there were irregularities in the 2020 election. There's no question. There were about a half a dozen states that changed the rules of elections in the name of COVID. Yep. Uh, and that undermined public confidence in the outcome of our elections. Now, at the end of the day, we brought more than 60 lawsuits, states engaged in, in recounts. Uh, and when states ultimately certified and courts upheld those changes in virtually every instance, and ultimately we were able to determine that, that the changes, there was no evidence that the changes had or change the outcome of the election in any way. Uh, I knew that my duty was clear that day. But candidly, as I've said before, um, you know, President Trump's words that day were reckless. I believe uh, whatever his intentions in that moment, it endangered me and my family and everyone that was at the Capitol that day. I believe history will hold him accountable for that, just as the law will hold everyone that that engaged in acts of violence. But may I just get, I mean, to the rest of us who weren't there, who were just participating or trying to in, in our democracy, 10 years ago, Democrats said, look, electronic voting machines can never be secure. And of course, that's obviously true. Anything electronic can be subverted. Real countries don't use electronic voting machines. Are you confident that a country with electronic voting machines, ours, can have an election that you're participating in that everyone can trust? Well, I, I believe we can, but I'm, I'm, I welcome the fact that since 2020, Republican-led states around the country have enacted election integrity reforms. I'm somebody that believes that, and Indiana was the first state to do this, I'm somebody that believes that you ought to be required to give a picture ID when you go in to vote. We ought to have voter ID in every state in America. But with regard to voting machines, I would tell you we had them in Indiana, but they in Indiana and elsewhere, they produce paper ballots. Recounts were taken in, in, in uh, states around the country. And I think it's absolutely essential that we do everything in our power to restore public confidence 
in the in the one person one vote principle at the heart yeah. of this republic. Why not just get rid of electronic voting machines and call it a day, and then we don't have to debate it? Well, I'm. Uh, I would certainly be open to that. Is there a downside? <laughs> But what I, what I believe, Tucker, is that states govern elections. States ought to conduct our elections. In fact, our founding fathers debated this at the Constitutional Convention. It was one of the reasons why I, I believe that my duty was very clear on that day. Despite the fact that my former running mate continues to hold the view that I had the right to overturn the election. I, I had no right to overturn the election. The presidency belongs to the American people and the American people alone. I, I had no right to reject or return votes that day. And Kamala Harris will have no right to overturn the election when we beat them in 2024. But this principle of state control of elections is absolutely vital. I mean, we've got to, uh, one of the very first bills that Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden brought to the floor of the Congress was a bill to nationalize our elections. It's what essentially brought me off the sidelines. It was the first thing I spoke publicly against uh, after I left my role as Vice President of the United States because you never want Washington, D.C. or any one person in Washington, D.C. deciding our elections. And the truth is that one of the ways that we've governed the integrity of our elections is by letting states like Iowa, like Indiana, every state across the country to be able to conduct our elections. So uh, if states were interested in going to all paper ballots, I would cheer them on. If states were willing to use with strong integrity, continue to use electronic machines, I'll cheer them on. But, but no state states has... should govern elections in America now and always. I think it seems like a good idea. It's a constitutional principle. Uh, that seems right to me. But, but in point of fact, no state, including ones with Republican governors, has really done anything about election integrity. They have not restored elections to what they were in, say, 1992, where you have paper ballots, you have voting on the day of the election, and you have voter ID. Like, these are super simple, but no one's done it. Why? Well, I, I think there's plenty of opportunity to uh, advance election integrity reforms around the country. As long as we don't intrude, uh, on the independence of states to conduct elections and to manage their elections. There are ways the federal government yep. could provide resources and encourage reforms. And if I'm president of the United States, I promise you, we'll fight every day to restore public confidence in the elections in this country. So you've issued a, thank you for that, you've issued a bunch of uh, public statements about your views on foreign policy, which are within, definitely within the mainstream of Republican views, as far as I can tell. Um, you recently met with Zelensky, according to news reports. And I'm wondering if during that meeting, as a prominent Christian leader, which you are in addition to your political views, you broached the question of his treatment of Christians within Ukraine. The Zelensky government has raided convents, arrested priests, has effectively banned a denomination, a Christian denomination, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church within Ukraine, has persecuted Christians. And I wonder if you raised that with him. I, I did raise the issue when we were there. And I, I raised it with the... Uh the leader of the Orthodox Church, when I was visiting Kiev, and asked him about concerns about religious liberty. He assured me that the Zelensky government in Ukraine was respecting religious liberty, even while recognizing that there were very small elements of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, that were being utilized for the purpose of advancing the Russian cause in Ukraine, and that they were they were taking steps to hold them to account. But the leader of the church at St. Michael's in Kiev told me personally that he, he believed that uh, the Zelensky government was respecting religious liberty. And I must tell you, I, other than the sanctity of life, there's no higher priority in my life than preserving the freedom of religion in America and championing religious liberty around the world. Well, I'm confused. On this question, it's very clear that the Zelensky government has arrested priests for having views they disagree with. That's not consistent with religious liberty. It's an attack on it, and we're funding it. And I'm just wondering how is it, and I don't mean to be disrespectful at all, but I sincerely wonder how a Christian leader could support the arrests of Christians for having different views. Well, what, what, what I can tell you is I asked 
a Christian leader in Kiev if that was in fact happening, and he assured me that it was not. People were not being persecuted for their religious beliefs. Now, he, he said let me, no let me, had let been me take a break here. I know we disagree on this strongly, but I, I respect your right to your opinion on Ukraine, and I trust you'll respect mine. But, look, but, I, look, but okay. look yes. I've been to Ukraine now twice. My wife and I traveled into Ukraine a month after the initiation of hostilities. We traveled then with a group called Samaritan's Purse, providing Christian relief to the millions of Ukrainians, women and children of every age that had to flee that country in the face of the unprovoked Russian invasion that began a year and a half ago. I did return, took an 11-hour train ride into Kyiv, also again with Samaritan's Purse. We not only met with government leaders, but we met with Christian relief workers. We're literally rebuilding homes of people in small towns, little hamlets, that a year ago were being shelled by Russian tanks. All the people in that community were just sitting in their homes. I mean, the, the truth is, what I saw was not just evidence of war, but I saw evil. And I believe that it is in the interest of the United States of America to continue to give the Ukrainian military the resources that they need to repel the Russian invasion and restore their sovereignty. Would you, may, may I ask, would, would you be, and I, I believe you have a good faith position on this, and we have disagreements on it, but I want to just, I, I can't let you elide over the question of the treatment of Christians. And I, I know, I, I heard and that would again. You be, well, no, but hold on. Would you, you, would you be willing? The problem is you don't accept my answer. I just told you that I asked the religious leader in Kiev if it was happening. You asked me if I raised the issue, and I did. And I'm saying I also raised it incorrect. with the Ukrainians, and I was told that there are, there are religious leaders who have been working with the Russian military that is murdering people by the thousands. Okay. I mean, tr Tucker, look. Uh, Wait, but hold on. Don't you think... Let me explain to you what I think our national interest is there. I would think you would have greater concern for religious liberty in Ukraine. And I'm surprised. I, I by told your you I raised on. the issue of religious liberty. No, you spoke to one person who's clearly I didn't on say one I side of it, one. and I, there are many, many news reports that are not disputed by anybody that right. many clergy have been arrested in Ukraine. And I'm merely saying I may not agree with their views. I'm not Russian Orthodox, but you can't arrest clergy for having different views. Period. Because if you do, you violate the basic tenet of look, religious I, liberty. Look, I won't look. I want to be clear with you. I won't stand by it. I won't stand for it. If people are being persecuted for their religious beliefs, I won't stand for it. In any country with which the country of our nation is supporting or our allies are supporting. Yes. Period. Paragraph. But let me say to you, our national interest in Ukraine, I believe, is born of the fact that I spent 10 years on the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Representatives. I spent four years as Vice President. I've met Vladimir Putin. Let me tell you, if Vladimir Putin overruns Ukraine, I have no doubt that in a short period of time that Russian military is going to cross a border of a NATO country that our armed forces will have to go and defend. You know, I started the day this morning at, at Rosie's in uh, Zionsville, Indiana with my son, Captain Michael J. Pence in the United States Marine Corps. My son's a fighter pilot. My son-in-law is a Navy fighter pilot. I'll tell you what, I never want to see American armed forces in Ukraine. I want to give the Ukrainian military what they need to fight and repel the Russian invasion. I think we need to stop them there so that our men and women in uniform are never called upon to stop that Russian military when they cross a border that we would have to defend. So you would oppose Ukraine entering NATO? Because that would, of course, immediately require us to go to war with Russia, I, which you oppose. I, you know, I said very clearly that um, Ukrainian uh, entrance into NATO should depend on when the war is over. And I made that clear with President Zelensky that that was my view. And what I understood in speaking with him was he understood that it needed to be conditional. If we were to allow Ukraine to join NATO today, then the obligations of the NATO Treaty on Mutual Defense would Im initiate immediately, and we'd be pulled into a conflict. We, I don't want that to happen. But I do believe that after the war is won and over, 
that welcoming Ukraine uh, into NATO, embracing them with open arms in the West, is the interest in the interest of our security and of our nation in the long term. And let me also say, Wait, I, I think this fight is also. Question? I think this fight is also about China, Tucker. I know we don't talk about that enough. I know. A lot of people say, and you may hear from some other candidates in this race, that we ought to be focused on China. Well, I, I gave the first major speech in our administration, changing administration policy on China. We called them out. We imposed tariffs. We rebuilt our military. I mean, in, in a very real sense, we were tougher on China than any administration in the modern era had ever been. But I really do believe that by giving the Ukrainian military what they need to repel the invasion, we will also send a deafening message to China uh, that America and the free world will not tolerate China's military ambitions in the Asia Pacific or their, or their, in, or their intention that becomes more clear by the day against Taiwan or any other, any other place. But I really do believe peace comes through strength. And the United States of America needs to continue to project strength. But let me say one last but thing. But we've on run out of ammunition, so we're sending them cluster bombs. So because we've sent our ammunition to Ukraine, mm -hmm. which has not yet won the war, whatever that means, no one has to find it. But isn't that prima facie evidence that we have become weaker militarily by our support from Ukraine, or how am I missing something? Well, we're for, out of ammunition, so we're sending cluster bombs. Well, first off, since Joe Biden took office, he's been working to cut military spending. And frankly, the recent debt ceiling deal that was done, if they don't pass all their 13 appropriations bills, will result in a 1% cut in our military spending after inflation in 2025. Look, China is floating a new battleship every month in the Pacific. We, we, we don't need to rebuild our military. We need to build a military strong enough to meet the challenges America will face in the 21st century. And as President of the United States, I'll do that. Amen. I promise you. Last question on Ukraine, though. The Pentagon says that because of the munitions and the material we have sent to Ukraine, yeah. we are we're very low in, right. in on our stockpiles. Is that a concern to you? Yeah. On, on the 155 artillery. And um, I, I have no reason to disbelieve that. Look, it's, uh, the answer, though, is the answer is not to shrink from America's role as leader of the free world. The answer is to invest in our national defense. I, I really do believe that. Look, remember, in a year and a half, and, and again, we have a strong disagreement on Well, I'm not sure we do. That's okay. Well, that'd be great if we didn't. But let me, let me say to you, we've made real progress there. Look, a year and a half ago, Russia had the second most powerful military in the world. Today, they have the second most powerful military in Ukraine. All right? That's progress. That's progress. And that's a result of what the United States and our allies have invested. But let me say one thing but, about well, Joe. I'm, I'm Can sorry. I say one thing about Joe Biden on this? Okay. And I've been critical of him. Look. Our administration came in, and the Obama-Biden administration had refused to give military support and resources to Ukraine. We ended that. We started providing Javelin missiles. I'll never forget standing in the woods a couple of weeks ago in a little town called Moshe, where uh, the soldier told me about when the Russian tanks approached and how many soldiers they lost in the first 24 hours. And then the colonel looked at me and smiled and said, and then the Javelin missiles arrived. And I said, we sent you those Javelin missiles. And he said, yes, sir, you did. I mean, we provided arms to Ukraine so they would be better equipped for this moment. But, but we asked a question. Came. I'm sorry. I'm Joe sorry. Biden I, I, cut off military okay. spending when he came in. And even after that heartless, unprovoked invasion, which Joe Biden actually said, we didn't know what we'd do if it was a small invasion. I mean, he signaled incredible weakness, especially after that disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. And all along the way, the Biden administration has been slow in providing military support. Make no mistake about this. We promised them 33 Abrams tanks in January. I heard again two weeks ago in Ukraine, they still don't have them. We've been telling them we'll train their F-16 pilots, but now they're saying maybe January, we'll let somebody transfer some jets. I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President, have you, I know you're running for president. You are, you. You are distressed notice. that the Ukrainians don't have enough American tanks. Every city in the United States has become much worse 
over the past three years. Yeah. Drive around. There's not one city that's gotten better in the United States. Right. And it's visible. Our economy has degraded. The suicide rate has jumped. Public filth and disorder and crime have exponentially increased. Right. And yet, your concern is that the Ukrainians, a country most people can't find on a map, who've received tens of billions of U.S. tax dollars, don't have enough tanks. Right. I think it's a fair question to ask, like, where's the concern for the United States in that? Well, it's not my concern. <laughs> Tucker, I've heard that routine from you before, but that's not my concern. I'm running for president of the United States because I think this country's in a lot of trouble. I think Joe Biden has weakened America at home and abroad. And as president of the United States, we're going to restore law and order in our cities. We're going to secure our border. We're going to get this economy moving again. And we're going to make sure that we have men and women on our courts at every level that will stand for the right to life and defend all the God-given liberties enshrined in our Constitution. Anybody that says that we can't be the leader of the free world and solve our problems at home has a pretty small view of the greatest nation on earth. We can do both. And as President of the United States, we will secure our border, we will support our military, we will revive our economy and stand by our values, and we will also lead the world for freedom under my administration. I promise you. Amen. Vice President Mike Pence, thank you very much. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we uh, just heard from Mike Pence. I'm checking in here, Sarah Gonzalez. I am joined by, of course, uh, Delano Squires is still here with us. And I am also joined by Matthew Peterson. He is the new Blaze Media Editor-in-Chief. We are so excited to have him. Uh, Peterson founded The American Mind, a publication of the Claremont Institute, and served as their Vice President of Education. He has two decades of experience in digital media, communications, political consulting, and program evaluation arising from a lifelong dedication to shaping hearts and minds to renew America. And and he, I would say, he lives in Dallas. This isn't on the paper, but I know he is a California refugee, which I find to be important because you do know what it's like to live on the other side of the country. Yes, I am uh, very happy to be back in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're glad you're here. So, um, obviously, a little, a little bit of a some tense moments between Tucker and Mike Pence, uh, particularly when it came to talking about um, January 6th, uh, when it came to talking about Ukraine as well. But I want, to, I want to flash back here for a second and kind of open up the conversation with uh, Trump's CNN town hall several months ago when he was asked whether he would apologize to Mike Pence for what happened on January 6th. This is clip 15, watch. One person who was at the Capitol that day, as you know, was your vice president, Mike Pence, who says that you endangered his life on that day. I don't do think he feel, was in any danger. Mr. President, do you feel that you owe him an apology? No, because he did something wrong. He should have put the votes back to the state legislatures, and I think we would have had a different outcome. I really do. I like Mike Pence very much. He's a very fine man. He's a very nice man. He made a mistake. His lawyer said, you cannot move. I called him the human conveyor belt. I said, even if the votes, you mean, I talked to his lawyer, even if the votes are absolutely fraudulent, he can't say, yes, sir, he can't say, but, and the Democrats played it and the rhinos played it. Right after the election, they all met, the rhinos and the Democrats, and they worked out a plan to make sure that future vice presidents don't do what I said you could do. Legal oh, experts, me. including Republican legal experts, say that he does not have that authority, Mr. Caitlin, President. But I want to why did on. they change the law then, saying that you can't do it? They didn't change the law. They strengthened the law because they were worried about oh, the president's exploiting. Oh, they strengthened it, meaning you could do it. <laughs> Thank that's, you. That's not what it means. Thank you. Now, Mike Pence today, uh, talking about January 6th, you know, you noted he was very um, emotional. He used very emotional language, very descriptive language. It almost sounded like he had some sort of PTSD from the day, uh, when in actuality, they verified all of those votes just a few hours later after everything happened. And so I'm just wondering, is he in touch with the base that he's talking to at all? Because I, it, to me, that didn't sound like a message that would resonate to this audience here. Yeah, you notice how uh, he always invokes these stern, solemn tones um, of the statesman, uh, stayed, right, very laid back, uh, very serious. He tried to give a nod to Ashley Babbitt, and I'm glad that Tucker called him out on that. To say, yeah. 
Wait, people died. Who are you talking about? Yeah. Because and I think maybe media Tucker lies about uh, you know uh, the the uh, the protesters killing people. Yeah. Right? Like, let's call it out. And then he, he goes Tucker to Ashley saved Babbitt, him. and and it, it absolutely saved him because otherwise you'd be thinking, okay, so you're just condemning uh, all the protesters uh, that day. And you know he did come out and say that that was nice, but it felt like he was trying to throw a bone or be balanced mm -hmm. in his staid, solemn you know <laughs> pronunciations on the topic. Um, were you were you comfortable enough with what he said about whether uh, we have done enough about ele election integrity in this country? Um, because, you know, he kind of, it felt to me like he didn't go all in and saying, hey, uh, there are some states with some peculiarities that we should have looked further into. Um, and perhaps the American people should not feel right now like they have a free and fair election. I mean... Here's the one thing that unites everyone we've heard some from so far today, and that is not a single one of them is ever going to be president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and part of the reason for that, uh, possibly, is that uh, Pence's attitude, right? I mean, he's talking about voter integrity, which is important, and he's, he is not wrong, right? right? He is not wrong that in many states, Florida, Texas, et cetera, they have passed legislation that has changed the dial. Um, they've gone back to, you know, just pre-COVID, if you're old enough to remember, uh, what the rules were. Right. But we have not completely swept, you know, all that BS away that, that came in a wave of legislation from the left. And certainly, I don't know any sane person who thinks in the key 10, 12 counties in, the, in this nation that we have resolved any of those structural problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so so to, to speak about it as if we've already resolved it, uh, we've made these strides. Yeah, we've made some strides, but you're not worried about that at all? Like, right. y y you don't see that as an existential crisis? Right. I don't know. Yeah, Delano, what are your thoughts on uh, Mike Pence's performance? Um, I, I think he had trouble with the Ukraine question. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I applaud Tucker Carlson for asking this particular question to every person he speaks to. Because I think at a certain point, our elected officials have to declare their primary allegiances. And, and when I hear, um, you know, Mike Pence or anyone else speak more passionately about defending the sovereignty and the borders of Ukraine than they do our own country, uh, that disturbs me. That would be as, as if I went home to my wife and, and our four kids and I said, look, there's a lady across town who's really not doing too well. And her, her shutters are, you know, need to be repaired and, and the doors falling off the hinges. And I'm going to spend all of my time, talent and treasure helping to rebuild her home and secure her family while I let my, my own um, sort of, you know, fall into disrepair. So I, I think every elected official needs to be pressed on this particular issue. And I don't think he handled it particularly well. Yeah, it, you know, it was fascinating because you heard him say uh, he believes in protecting religious freedom all over the world. And it's like everywhere, forever, no matter the cost. Do you not see what, how much we have already donated to this money laundering scheme in Ukraine? And you're still going to stand here and say, whether, you know, and everything else aside, I intend to protect religious freedom all over the world. I don't think that that is what the average American wants to hear right now. And I certainly don't think that they want to hear that they have a small view of the United States if they don't believe that we want to be the world's police. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just step back a bit and do a short bio on Pence. I mean, for most of us, I think it's pretty similar to my own experience. Pence, great guy, Indiana governor. He's doing all this stuff. He's very socially conservative. Remember, though, the cracks in the wall started to appear on the issue of religious liberty in Indiana some years ago when Salesforce, Salesforce, the enormous company, and Mark Benioff went against a bill that Pence had proposed uh, for the sake of religious liberty that would protect Christian uh, mm -hmm. business owners mm -hmm. from having to uh, do things they didn't believe in, right? And, and, and Pence backed down famously on that. He cracked. And he has an argument, you know, for why he did that, that it was principled. But I know lots of people in, you know, quietly, we can't say it out loud, I'm going to say it out loud, in the religious community who thought he showed weakness then, right? Then he becomes vice president. We all like him again. He's a good guy. Uh, but there is that kind of beaten dog aspect to, you know, trailing around Trump the entire time. Uh, and then he comes out as if now he's the statesman, you know, turning on Trump in, in so many ways. And then you're going to talk about religious liberty in Ukraine as the, I mean, this is this is so far removed from what anyone cares about in right. America right now. Right.